Welcome back to my channel for a comprehensive and very detailed video for the new Leica Q3. A lot of people who regularly visit my channel ask for this and now I decided to do it and share with you all the insights I had in this new full frame compact camera from Leica which I had already weeks before market launch thanks to Leica Switzerland and Leica Zurich. And since there is a lot of ground to cover in the menu if we just quickly flip through that I will split the video into three parts and part one and part two will deal with settings, tweaks, tips and tricks for still images. I will cover a lot of things here, in particular on drive mode, everything you need to know about these different options. I will look into focusing and how to best use them for your photography workflow, including tracking of course. Everything I'm going to tell you will come with a live demonstration so you really see what's going on. We'll look in detail into the four exposure metering options here and how you can use them. And uh, in part two on still images, I will go through a lot of more settings here in the camera. I will also look because again, a lot of people ask for that into shooting remotely with the Leica Photos app and in this context, I will also show you how to download and use the new Leica looks, which you find under JPEG settings. So there's a lot of things to come in the next three videos. This is part number one. And if you have not seen my introductory video to the Leica Q3, please look it up. I will post the link down below in the info box together with a couple of other videos I already had on my channel on the new Leica Q3. And now let's kick off the video. The first step I'm going to do now is to reset the camera to factory settings. And that will help you if you take the camera fresh out of box. You have a starting point, an anchor point where the tutorial starts. So let's go here into the very last page, page number six. Let's go to reset camera. Let's say we reset all settings. We reset the user profiles. We reset all the connections, the image counter, custom LUTs, Leica looks. This is all freshly as out of box now. I'm going to switch it off and then I will switch it on. The first thing you see when you inserted the battery after taking the camera out of box is a nice little animation specified for the Leica Q3. So let's switch the camera on and let's watch that animation. Now the camera is ready for being set up and I go for English language. We connect the Leica Photos app later. Let's skip this for the time being. Time zone is correct in my case, Berlin. Then we have daylight saving time on. That's the season of the year here. We get the date right. So the date today is first of all, day, month, year is fine for me. So with the right hand side control button here, I go to the date and then we have today the 30th and that is uh, June by now. So let's go to June and uh, it's 2023. So we take this over time setting and I think we have now 19. Let's go here to 19 and it is 1917. So let's go in the other direction. Let's also press and hold then it goes very quickly. 1917, that's it. So now the camera is set up with the most basic settings on date time, time zone and so on. And we can continue to the first thing you should always do when you have a new camera and just took it out of box and inserted the batteries. Let's assume that besides inserting the battery, you also inserted an SD card already. Then if there is no data on that card, which you need, otherwise you need to back it up, go and format the SD card. And that's important in particular, if you take an SD card freshly out of box, make sure you format it at least once in the camera. So we go here to page number five. On page number five, we have format card and we say, yes, I wanna format the card. Let's do that. You see the LED here flashing during the formatting process. And when this LED is off, then the card is freshly formatted. The next step to get the camera ready for shooting is to do some basic settings. So let's go here to page number one. And here, first of all, we have drive mode. And in drive mode, we have single, we have continuous with different frames per second. So the burst speed is here address. Then we have interval shooting and exposure bracketing. And for the time being, let's go here to single. And then we see this here, if we press and hold the shutter button and the camera found focus, in this case on the body of Jennifer here in front of me, then this rectangle turns green and uh, you can basically release the shot. Besides the way I just showed, namely via the menu to get into drive mode, there is a different way. And whenever you are in live view, 
Let's just half press the shutter button and focus. Whenever you're in this viewing mode here, live view on the camera, you press once the menu button, you get into the status screen. And in the status screen, I can also tweak my drive mode and I can tap, touch, you know, have full touch functionality. So here we had single, then we have the different continuous modes with different bits and with different frame rates. We have interval shooting and we also have here exposure bracketing. The next setting we find in the menu is on page one, the self timer. Now self timer is self explanatory. You can switch it off. Or if you have your camera on a tripod, you can go for two seconds or 12 seconds. There's nothing in between and that is the typical Leica standard. Already here at that point, when we talk about self timer, let's do something a bit more sophisticated because it might be tedious to always from live view, go into the menu, find page one, then wherever you are before, go into self timer and activate that for two seconds or 12 seconds. Maybe you wanna have this on a customized function button and uh, there are various of them on the camera. So I would say we go for this button here, press and hold it. If you press and hold it, you get here a bunch of options what you can choose. Let's go down here to the self timer, let's select it and let's go back into live view. And then whenever I press shortly now this button here, I can directly choose my self timer. Simple like that and works very well. There are many more options we can customize here if I press and hold that and we come to that in the course of the video. For the time being, I wanted to show if you want a quick access to your self timer, customize this button here for instance, press it shortly, you get into this menu, you can choose two seconds, 12 seconds or you can choose off and this works very well. Next, let's decide about image quality and the easiest way to go there is to press the menu button once, then you are on the status screen. And we have here the quality settings and there are a bunch of options. If I go to the very left hand side, we have large DNG. DNG stands for digital negative, is the Adobe Notion for a RAW file. We have medium resolution DNG, small resolution DNG. Then we get combinations, large JPEG, large DNG, large JPEG, medium DNG and so on. And you see there are lots of combinations I can choose here. We also have JPEG standalone at the very end. So here's large JPEG, medium JPEG and small JPEG. For the time being, I wanna have here large JPEG and large DNG and that will be my setting. Now, all these combinations can also be selected in different menus when we go to page number two. On page number two, we have first of all here all possible settings on photo file format. We have, as you just saw when I swiped on the touch screen, we have DNG, DNG plus JPEG and JPEG only. I wanna go here for DNG and JPEG. And then we have here the DNG resolution, which you also saw in these combinations when we swiped at the bottom here, we have large, medium and small with different resolution, 60, 36 and 18 megapixel. And we have also in the JPEG settings, the resolution, which you just again saw when I swiped here, that you can combine here, for instance, also a large JPEG with a medium DNG. And we can select this here. And then we have again, large, medium and small. And that works very well in the settings. If you have it in the touch screen, you get all these combinations here at the bottom to swipe in all different possible combinations. And the number of combinations we can swipe through here is all in three plus three plus nine. So all in 15 combinations. If you need quick access to the file format, so DNG versus JPEG or both, or to the resolution of DNGs and JPEG, you can also assign this to a function button in the same way as I showed before for the self timer. So currently we have here the self timer. And uh, if I press and hold that, we can choose other functions to be assigned to that button. And I scroll down very quickly here. And you see here we have, first of all, the file format for the photo. So let's choose this. If I now press quickly this button, I can toggle between DNG plus JPEG, JPEG only, or DNG. We can also have a different function here, pressing and holding. We can also say we want to tweak with that button and quickly switch from 60 megapixel RAW files to 36 megapixel RAW files. So if I select this here and press it quickly, I can switch here. Here we have LDNG 60 megapixel. Here we have medium resolution 36 and here we have small and then this is on the function button. So you see this works with many, many settings in the camera that I can assign it to this button or to this button or also to other buttons like here on the top is a customizable button and so on. And that gives you quick access to things you really need in your workflow. And the workflow can also change depending on the shooting situation, of course. Let's now talk about settings for autofocus. And uh, for autofocus, we have here a dedicated menu on page number one. It's the third entry here. 
And if we look into that, we have here, first of all, the focus mode. The focus mode has three different options, intelligent, autofocus single, autofocus continuous. I do not recommend to go for intelligent autofocus. This really is a beginner setting and means that the camera selects the focus point by itself and the embedded algorithms. Don't go for that. Go for autofocus single or autofocus continuous because then you can tell the camera where to focus and that is much more meaningful. We then have here autofocus mode and here we have a bunch of options. Multi-field, spot, field, zone, tracking and eye and face and body detection. If I choose that for instance, that's the mode I'm currently in. You see when I half press the shutter button, that square around Jennifer's face turns green and it also recognizes the eyes. And uh, that is a mode which is typical for portraits and people photography. If you want to make face detection and or eye detection effective, then you need to switch to a different focus mode. Because we are currently in autofocus single, let's go back where we've been before. So focus mode, autofocus single, and that is not the right setting if you wanna go for people photography. Go to autofocus continuous, and then as long as I half press the shutter button, my focus will be readjusted whenever there are movements in the scene. For instance, if Jennifer would move here in the scene, the focus would be updated in the frame in front of me. And you can also switch to that by the status screen, just press menu, then you have here the menu, autofocus single, that's where we've been before. You have intelligent autofocus, avoid that, go to autofocus continuous here, and then you see as long as I half press the shutter button, it's updating. You can also here toggle between the eyes and you do this with the control button here. So let's have a look and let me zoom in a little bit. Currently the left hand eye is activated. Now let's switch to the right hand eye and you see it turned from white to yellow. Let's go back to the left hand eye. Now the left hand eye is yellow. If I press it again, the right hand eye will be yellow again. And if I now half press the shutter button to focus, you see now the right hand eye is green and the left hand eye is white. If I toggle, it's the other way around. Now if I press and hold, the left hand eye is green and the right hand eye is white. And in this way you can select on which eye of your subject you want to focus. It's actually a very simple procedure and works in practical shooting situations very well. Before I had a single subject in my scene, namely Jennifer, and I pushed Jennifer a little bit to the right hand side of the frame now and brought in the Witcher. And you see the Witcher's face is recognized if I half press the shutter button. I can also toggle here between the eyes. So currently the right hand eye is green, the left hand eye is white. Let me toggle and now the sides have been switched. Left hand eye is sharp and in focus and the right hand eye is white. I can now also toggle between these faces because the camera recognizes there are two subjects with faces in the scene. And if I wanna toggle here now, I push that control button again and then I'm on Jennifer's face and the face is recognized from time to time, body detection kicks in with this large rectangle because I'm here in macro mode. That's not ideal of course and I'm also very close to the camera. That's why I switched the lens to macro mode. But you see Jennifer's eyes are back and uh, I can switch between faces now. Here is the Witcher and here is Jennifer. And that works quite nice. So if you have several subjects in a scene, you can also jump with the control button here from one subject to the other subject. Let's spend more time on the autofocus system of the Leica Q3. And first of all, I went here to eye face body detection. Let's go back into the menu. Let's go into focusing and autofocus mode but I can go one more step down here and then I get eye face body detection also for animals. And that is quite nice if you wanna shoot your cat or your dog. So there are different ways what you can do. Remember, you can also get into this by the status screen. So if I press the menu button and I tap here, we have here eye face body detection and then here is eye face body and animal detection. Let's now look into the other autofocus modes we have here. First of all, we have multi-field and that is something we can quickly try out here in the studio. In the multi-field autofocus mode, the camera takes control. And uh, here I have, first of all, my aperture widest open to f1.7 and I have only one subject in the scene, which is clearly separated from the background. If I half press the shutter button, Jennifer's body gets detected and the autofocus picks up on Jennifer's body. If you have a single subject like before Jennifer and it's also clearly separated from the background, multi-field works quite well. But what if you have a second subject in the scene? So we have now on the left-hand side the Witcher, on the right-hand side Jennifer. Let's just half press the shutter button and then it finds the Witcher no longer Jennifer. And that is of course not what you want because you might wanna have the Witcher here in the scene, but you wanna have nevertheless your focus sitting on Jennifer. So multi-field is an option where you leave a lot of control to the camera. Let's have a look here. And you see 
the autofocus system starts to search and then it finds typically the subject which is a bit closer to the camera which I think is here the case for the Witcher. That is what happening here. Now if we go back to the scene we had before, we have Yennefer in here and Multifield finds Yennefer's body. Other things can happen. Let's move Yennefer a little bit more to the right hand side here in the frame and still the camera will find Yennefer's body. But look what happens if another subject now comes into the scene and basically takes away sight to Yennefer. Let's have a look here. So here's the Witcher and now the Witcher steals the focus from Yennefer. Do you see that? All of a sudden Yennefer is blurry and that subject coming unexpected in the scene was stealing the autofocus away from the subject I originally wanted to focus on. And that's again why multi-field is an option I hardly use. Let me actually get focus back to Yennefer because you just don't have control over what's going on in your focusing. So we saw that multi-field is not an ideal mode if you wanna have your focus getting sticky on a subject and the much better mode I use typically is tracking. So let's go here into the status screen. Let's tap here and let's go into tracking. And uh, now in tracking, I have in the middle my frame and uh, when I half press the shutter button, the camera will start to try to focus on the background, which is not possible because I'm in macro mode. So let's switch this to standard mode. And then if I half press the shutter button, it will focus on the background here. Of course, I can also move that tracking field. So I can move it here horizontally. I can move it vertically. I can also use the touch functionality to place it somewhere. Let's place it here. And if I half press the shutter button now, it will try to focus there. And if I now release the shutter button, the focus field will jump back to the center of the frame. Have a look, I release it now, boom, it's back at the center. So why is that? Well, there is a tweak in the menu which we can use to steer this. The setting in the menu I'm talking about is here. We go back into focusing and in focusing, we scroll all the way down and then here is a menu entry saying autofocus tracking start position. And this is currently at the center. So let's have a look again so you see the difference. Let me focus here on that camera. Let's focus. If I release the shutter button, boom, it jumps back to the center. Let's now change this setting and let's get the lens back into macro mode so that we can play with Yennefer here, standing very close to the camera. So first of all, let me focus on Yennefer's face here. It's recognized, you see that? And uh, if I release the shutter button, the focus field jumps back to the center. That's what we currently had. And because I'm in macro mode, it cannot focus in the center because the distance to the opposite wall is too big. So let's go to Yennefer's body here and then let's focus. And here it's sitting. Now it will track and that's why it is called tracking. Let me move Yennefer and you see the focus field is staying on Yennefer. And that is why it is called tracking, of course. Now, the other two menu entries I have here, let's quickly try them out. You saw it jump back to the center. Let's go into the setting here. Let's go all the way down here and let's take now last position. So here we go. Let's place the focus field again on Yennefer, half pressing the shutter button. Let's move Yennefer. The focus follows. As I said, I'm in macro mode. That's not ideal here. Let's stop tracking here, release the shutter button. It stays where it was and that is called the last position as you see here. Let's go back here and you see it said the last position. I stopped tracking at the left hand side of the frame and that's where the field is staying. So it stays with the subject. That is the second setting of this autofocus tracking position. The last setting is recall. So let's go into the menu and let's go here to recall and you will see the difference immediately. So let's go here. Let's start the tracking now on the left hand side of the frame. Let's move Yennefer. It keeps tracking. Let's release the shutter button here. And now it jumps back. So it recalls where Jennifer was originally standing and where the tracking started and kicked off. You saw that? You saw the difference? Let's do this again. Let's place the autofocus field on Yennefer. Let's move Yennefer. And if I now move Yennefer and keep half pressing the shutter button, when I release the shutter button, that focus field will jump back to where we start now. Let's do this again. It follows Yennefer. And now if I release the shutter button, it jumps to that original position. That is the recall. Here now I'm back in last position because then the focus field stays where I stopped tracking. So let's go into live view again. Let's focus on Yennefer. Let's track Yennefer's face here or body. Let's release the shutter button. The focus field stays there. And by the way, this is a three-dimensional update of the focus you see. I can also move Yennefer away from the camera or closer to the camera, still in macro mode here. It will get sticky 
and tracks Yennefer's body. The next focus mode I want to quickly illustrate is zone and let's go into the status screen. Let's go here from tracking to zone and then you see a bunch of focus points in the center of the frame. Again, I can move this group of focus points horizontally or vertically. I can also use my fingers and touch and you see now the focus updated to the background of the scene here. And uh, the problem with zone is the camera figures out within this group of focus points where the focus should sit. And that is in the same way as multi-field not convenient because it might not be my choice what the camera is deciding for. So let's show this. If I tap here on the body of Yennefer, you see it selects a different focus point at the side. Now it jumped back to Yennefer. So this is not a reliable focusing method and I do not really recommend it. There will be situations and there are a couple of examples in the manual where this is meaningful, but most of the time I'm not using it. And uh, the good thing is if you touch here, it updates automatically. Now this is the background. Let's try to get Yennefer back. It's not working. If I go here, I need to be lucky to catch Yennefer's body. Now I have it, you see? So this is not really a precise way of placing your focus on a subject. And again, is a mode I use not very often. There are two more focusing modes I wanna quickly mention. Let's go back into the status screen and let's switch from zone to field. And then you see I get an autofocus field here. I can move it up and down or to the side with the control buttons. And I can also move it with my fingers because I have touch functionality activated. I show this in the menu in a moment. So see if I tap now here on the background, the background gets sharp and Yennefer gets blurry. And if I manage to get this back on Yennefer's body, then Yennefer will get sharp and the background is blurry. Now you saw it took me three attempts to get this done. And the reason is, that we have here face detection, contrast detection, and the focus field is quite large. So if I really wanna be precise so that my focus can be measured on Yennefer's body, I tap and hold the LCD screen, and then we see here two red arrows in the diagonal corners. And now I can make this smaller, and then I can more precisely focus by touch. Let's focus on the background again. This is good. Let's focus on Yennefer's body again, boom. No more error and no more trials. It just works now much better because my focus field is so small that it immediately stays on Yennefer's body and has no overlaps to the background. Now it's precise and I can always jump forth and back between my background and my foreground. Of course, I can also get this back into the other sizes. So this is the smallest size. This is the medium size where we already had three attempts to get Yennefer Sharpen in focus. And this is the large size. And this is the worst if you wanna work with touch focus. Let's try this. Here's the background sharp. Here is Yennefer, but it's not recognizing Yennefer. It's still staying on the background. See that? I can do whatever I want. If I make this now small, this will no longer happen. So let's go here to small. And now I can focus on the background. I can focus on Yennefer and I can focus on the background and back on Yennefer. The field completely fits on Yennefer's body is small enough. That's the way it works and that's field focus mode. And then there's one last one here, which is spot. Let's go to that here. And here we have spot. By the way, this one we already looked into at the beginning, that was multi-field. So spot gives me a little cross and that is the most precise way now, in particular when you go for touch autofocus, to place your focus field. Here it's the background, here is Yennefer's body. Here's the background. Here is Yennefer's body back. I can very precisely with that little cross, which turns green when focus was found, measure for focus on a subject. You see that? And that is of course an interesting option if you have a very small subject where you really wanna in a precise way place your autofocus. And you see this is also in small increments only in the way it jumps here on horizontal and vertical direction if I use the control button. And I can use easily my finger here to control where my focus is sitting on the background, the foreground, on what subject and what have you. In order to benefit from touch autofocus, as I was showing it here now various times, you need to get the setting right. And the setting is under focusing and is down here and it has three settings. It has off, touch autofocus and touch autofocus and release. If I'm on off, then the screen is not reacting to my tabs. Let's see here. No matter where I tap, the focus cross is not moving. Then we have touch autofocus. That's the setting I was using all the time. So I don't have to demonstrate this again. This is here. And then we have touch autofocus and release. And that's a convenient feature because it not only moves the focus field, activates the focus mechanism, it also releases the shot. So let's have a look on this. And uh, let me focus on the background. I touch, it will focus and release the shot. Have a look. 
Here is the shot. Yennefer is blurry. The background is sharp. Let's take a picture of Yennefer. And you see that works very, very quickly, is super spot on and is a good way, in particular in street photography, when you go into waist level view on the display, let me go there here, then you can look at the display from the top and can just touch and it will immediately release the shot. So that is a convenient feature and I use this from time to time. There are a couple of other settings under focusing, which I want to quickly mention for the sake of completeness. Let's go into the menu on focusing. We covered focus mode, autofocus mode. We have autofocus assistant lamp and that is in my setting always on because there is a little light at the front side of the camera illuminating a bit the subject in front of the camera. You can switch this off, which might be under certain circumstances a meaningful setting. I always have this on. Then we have focus assist and we come to that menu when we speak about manual focusing. We spoke about touch autofocus and touch autofocus and release. And we also have here touch autofocus in electronic viewfinder mode. And if I go into that menu here, we have first of all the option to deactivate touch autofocus when the eye is on the electronic viewfinder. And this is the most meaningful setting for me. I switch it to off because typically I have my eye on the electronic viewfinder and then once in a while my nose touches the LCD display and that would move the autofocus field to a direction where I don't want to have it. So I have this off typically, but you can also have it on and let me simulate this for a moment. Well, let's start with off. So since I have here activated automatically switching to electronic viewfinder, if I approach the sensor here, I can simulate that my eye is now on the electronic viewfinder. And uh, now let's say the focus cross here is in the middle of the frame. Let's tap somewhere. Let's go back and you see it didn't move. So it is deactivated and if my nose touches the LCD, when I have my eye on the electronic viewfinder, nothing will happen to my focus field or focus cross here. I can also switch it on and I can also demonstrate this here by the same technique as what I just did. So we go here to touch AF in EVF. Let's switch it on. Let's see what happens. You see currently the focus cross is in the middle of the frame on Jennifer's body. Let's simulate my eye on the electronic viewfinder. Let's tap somewhere else in the frame. Let's get my eye off the electronic viewfinder and you see it moved. Now it's here. So touch autofocus obviously is now activated. Let's do this again. Let's tap somewhere else here in another part of the frame. Let's get the eye of the electronic viewfinder and now the cross is here. So now touch autofocus is active, although I have my eye on the electronic viewfinder. The last setting we have here is the following. Let's go into the menu. Let's go here into touch AF in EVF. And then we have AF quick setting only. And that is a name which is quite misleading. And we saw that before, what it actually means is that you can toggle the size of your focus field. And that is what is missing in the name here. It should say autofocus field size toggling and not autofocus quick setting only. But I can demonstrate to you what it means in a very simple way. Let's go back into live view. So we have this activated now. Let's go back into live view and let's switch so that we see what's going on to field focus. So we go here back to field. And you remember, I could toggle my size by pressing and holding it and then changing it in the control wheel setup here or with a pinch to zoom, which I never use because it's not working very well. So let's simulate again that my eye is on the electronic viewfinder by blocking that sensor here and let's tap somewhere in the frame. Let's remove it. And you see my focus field is not moving. It stays where it was before, namely on Jennifer's body. And that's because it says here under focusing in the menu, autofocus quick setting only. As I said, what it should say is autofocus field size only. And I'm going to show this now. So let's again get the eye on the electronic viewfinder. Let's tap and hold here and let's move by two clicks here on the wheel. If I remove this now, you see my autofocus field changed from small to large. And that is the only setting that works if you have your eye on the electronic viewfinder. If you go in focusing, in this menu entry to autofocus quick setting only. It's not really well described in the menu, but once you know how it works, you can use it in your workflow. The next group of settings I want to discuss is in drive mode. So let's go back to page number one. The very first entry here is drive mode. And here we have single, different settings under continuous. I come to them in a moment and interval shooting. And interval shooting is a simple intervalometer. You can specify here how many frames you want to shoot. So if you want to cancel this out, we could here say, for instance, 1,500 frames. Let's get the zero here. 
and then we checkbox this and then we have 1500 frames. We also can toggle the interval which is between consecutive frames and the lowest you can have here is one second. You see, there is nothing where you can make this even quicker. One second is end of story. If you go to zero, you cannot activate this. So you have one second and then it will take a shot. It will wait for a second. It takes the next shot. It will wait for a second and so on. Typically, if you would say you would go here for moving clouds in the sky, you would probably go here more to like 10 or 15 seconds, what have you. But you can play with that and can get it right for whatever you want to capture. And then we have here an initial countdown and that is very useful because if you would go for longer exposures, let's say you make a time lapse of the Milky Way, your first frame will be ruined because you will have shakes and vibrations when you release the shutter button here. So you can also specify here a countdown and you could say, for instance, this is a five second countdown and then the time lapse will kick off. Let's quickly do that. Oh, stop. Before we actually kick this off, let's get the parameters different. So let's go back into drive mode and into interval shooting. We keep it at 1500 frames, but we make the interval shorter. Let's say we go here to three seconds. Here we go. And let's also make the countdown shorter to two seconds. Here we go. And now I can kick this off and you see on the LCD display that the camera shows to me that we have a two second countdown before the interval sequence kicks off and that we are going to shoot the first frame the moment in time we activate the shutter button here. So let's go for this. This is super boring because nothing will happen. This is a static scene. You see the LED flashing, the red one, and you also hear how the camera is taking the pictures one frame every two seconds. Now, if you want to break the sequence up, there is always an option for you to push that button here. You push that button and then it says interval shooting continue or end and you can continue. Then it will basically continue shooting the frames as long as the counter is not depleted, which was 1500 frames in my case, or you say end, push the button again and then it takes you out of that shooting sequence. That is very convenient that you can break it up and don't have to switch the camera on or off or things like that. In my introductory video on the Leica Q3, which I posted on the day of the announcement, you actually find in that video an example of a time lapse 8K actually in resolution shot with this interval shooting setting here in the menu. And then we have here exposure bracketing, which I use for stacking images later on and creating HDR images. So if we go into that, we can toggle here between three frames and five frames. You also get here a visual representation of the number of frames and the EVs, they are apart from each other. Have a look. This is three. This is now five. You can tweak the EVs here and you can go as narrow as one third EVs, but you can also go as far as three full stops and you see then how it spreads over this axis here. So this is very well done by Leica. You also have exposure compensation here and exposure compensation shifts the frames to the left or to the right. Have a look here. Now I have here minus one, zero, one, two and three EVs. I can also go into the other direction and in this way you can become creative in your exposure bracketing shooting. And then we have a last setting here which is on or off. If it is off for each frame of the five here in that particular setting, you have to use the shutter release button. If you are on automatic on, then the camera is taking five consecutive frames for you and is doing this all fully automatically. So we can try this out for a moment. I go back into live view and I just Press and hold the shutter button, focus, and then I kick off the sequence. Have a look how the brightness of the image changes over these five different frames. You saw that is very convenient. Now I can take these five frames, stack them together in Lightroom and get in this way a nice HDR image.
We've now covered exposure bracketing, interval shooting, single is self-explanatory. What about continuous? And there is something interesting going on here, which I also want to make people aware. We can here shoot continuous in two frames per second, four, seven, nine, and 15, and then we come to interval shooting. But there is some remark here in the menu entry, which you should be aware of because two, four, and seven frames per second will be shot in 14 bit. If you go faster on nine frames and 15 frames per second, you will only be able to shoot at 12 bit. And only for two FPS and four FPS, you will have autofocus. So autofocus is updating during the sequence you are shooting. If you are on seven, nine or 15, autofocus will be the same on consecutive frames as it was on the first frame. So the autofocus is not updating and you should be aware of that. Let's try this out, how this looks like. Let's go to continuous for FPS and uh, let's see how this looks like. So this is how it sounds and how it looks like. Four frames per second is not super strong in terms of speed. Uh, we see this much better on other digital cameras like the Nikon C8, which just came to market. But it is at least something. What you should also be aware is that this is still writing. Now it stopped and you see this by the flashing LED light to the SD card. Let's do this again. And now you see, even when I stopped shooting, the LED is still flashing, which means the images are processed towards the SD card. And until then, you basically have still part of your buffer used in the camera before everything is loaded onto the SD card. And now the process is completed. And here's a word of caution for beginners. We have the word continuous showing up in this tutorial twice. Once in the shooting here in drive mode, continuous shooting and that means as I just demonstrated continuously taking shot by pressing and holding down the shutter release button and then the camera fires one frame after another. But we also saw continuous in the autofocus here. Namely here we saw autofocus single and autofocus continuous and that is a totally different topic so don't mess this up and mix it up right. This is about your autofocus updating when your subject moves, for instance, towards the camera or away from the camera, as long as you have pressed down the shutter button and the subject is in the focus frame, it will update the autofocus. That's what the word continuous here means under AFC or autofocus continuous. In drive mode, it's purely about shooting at a certain burst rate with, for instance, seven frames per second. So keep these two notions of continuous apart please. I've covered now everything under drive mode, self timer, focusing and I need to speed up a little bit. This video will get way off too long. But exposure metering is important and again we can access this via the menu and we have here spot, center weighted, highlight weighted and multi field. I'll quickly explain them in a moment. I can also access exposure metering by the status screen and it's in the lower left hand side corner and you find here the four options. This is spot, center weighted, highlight weighted and multi-field. And I want to quickly explain how they work. So let's try to get this done. Let's first of all go here into spot and I'm here on field autofocus and watch what happens if I move my autofocus field. By the way, this looks a bit scary now because I have a very bright LED in the background to illustrate my point. First of all, you see now here that the focus field is on Jennifer's body and Jennifer's body is here where the scarf is very dark and that's why the scene is very bright. If I move to a more bright area, say to her face, the scene darkens and you see that. If I come from here, it darkens. If I would go to the extreme and place my focus field on that LED in the background, the scene completely darkens because spot metering means it meters light where your spot focus cross is or your focus field and where the focus would sit. And that's how spot metering works. Very simple like that. If you go back to Jennifer's body, you see the scene brightens up because here we have a more dark subject underlying the focus field and that's why everything gets brighter. Here is something bright underlying the focus field and then the whole scene gets very dark. So far I've only explained spot metering and before I come to center weighted, highlight weighted and multi field, we need to talk about auto exposure lock because that's what I will need to illustrate my points. What we saw before is that if I move my focus field, which is also the light metering area, the scene updates with respect to brightness depending on where I place my field. And that of course also happens if I recompose the shot. So let's focus on Jennifer, let's recompose and you see now it hits the LED light in the background 
and the scene darkens. Using auto exposure lock, I can avoid that the scene darkens when I recompose by locking the exposure. So let's do this. I want to assign this function to a custom button. So let's press and hold on this one here. Let's go down to auto exposure lock. And now let's focus and meet a light and let's lock the exposure. And then you see in the lower left hand side corner a lock symbol with AE for auto exposure. And that signalizes to me that my exposure is now locked. And now if I recompose, it's no longer darkening. You see that the exposure stays the same because it is locked independent of how I recompose my shot. And if I want to release that, I push that button again and then light metering kicks in again and is updating according to what's underlying that focus and light metering field. What I can do in this way is of course, finding a spot in the scene where the light is optimal. Let's say maybe somewhere here. So let's lock the exposure. You see that symbol coming up again. Let's go back, let's focus on Jennifer. And now if I focus on Jennifer's body, light metering will also happen again at the dark part of Jennifer's body, but exposure will no longer become brighter because I locked it. Now we have found focus and I have in the play mode, let's go here into play. You see the image I just shot and Jennifer is super sharp and no longer overexposed. So in this way, I separated the light metering from the focusing. Let's do this again. We find a spot here somewhere where light metering is probably giving a good exposure of Jennifer, maybe here. Let's lock exposure. Let's go back to Jennifer and let's focus on her. Let's take the shot, goes back into live view. But if I press play, here's the shot I was just taken. And you see Jennifer looks good, no longer overexposed and really sharp. So separating the light metering process from the focusing for image recomposition, that is a technique pro photographers use all the time. Since we have now explored that tool called auto exposure lock, we can move on on different light metering methods and go to center weighted. And center weighted meters light in the entire frame. But the values in the center have a bit more weight than the values at the edges. And uh, you don't see a difference here if I recompose and uh, the exposure stays basically the same. I can nevertheless, via auto exposure lock, show you now how center weighted metering updates if I meet a light at a much brighter area. So if I point the camera upwards, I have here a very bright area. And here now I lock my exposure by pressing that button I just customized for that. Locking it, you see we have no auto exposure lock symbol in the lower left hand side corner. Let's focus on Jennifer and let's take a shot. With that shot, the exposure is released. You see that the symbol is no longer there. And let's now take a shot without before locking the exposure on a brighter area in the scene. And let's compare these two images. So here's the image I just shot. And then here's the image where I locked exposure before on a brighter part of the scene. And the difference is clearly visible here. And that's how center weighted works. The next metering method is highlight weighted. And that is an ingenious one because of the high dynamic range of the Leica Q3. So what it means is it will meter the entire frame, but it will pay attention to highlights to not overly overexpose them. And that is something I highly recommend if you have different lightings in a scene, because you can always, if the camera is adjusting for the highlights, if your shadows get very dark, recover information later out of shadows based on the high dynamic range of the Leica Q3 and in general, these modern Leica cameras. The difference to center weighted is not much, but it is visible. So let me illustrate this. Let's take a shot with highlight weighted on Jennifer's body focus take the shot. Let's change the metering method to center weighted. Let's take the same shot, focus on Jennifer. Here we go. And here is the center weighted shot. And here is the highlight weighted shot. And you see the colors in the background are a bit better in the background bokeh. And the scene here, if I go for highlight weighted is a bit darker because the highlights are taken into account. As I said, the difference is not much but is visible and recognizable. The last light metering method here is multi-field. So let's go into that. Let's choose it. And that means that the camera meters light in different parts of the scene based on a proprietary algorithm, figures out the exposure and then calculates the correct values. And uh, it looks pretty not spectacular. And it is typically very useful in scenes where you have evenly distributed light, not if you have a dominance by highlights or shadows 
then you need to become a bit more tricky and typically go for other light metering methods. By the way, here is a one minute education. Do you know how exposure metering is turned into action on the parameters of the camera? It's very simple to illustrate here. Let's go into the status screen. Let's go here into spot metering and let's also go here into spot. And then we have that little cross, you know, and if I move it, it updates based on the light metering and the brightness of the underlying spot under that little cross here. So that's what we know from what I said before in the video. And I'm here in aperture priority. I have fixed my ISO value and the aperture I've chosen is f1.7. So in the light triangle, the only value that can be used to be updated when I meet a light in different brightness levels of the scene is the shutter speed and that's here. So watch what happens to the shutter speed if I move that cross where I meet the light on the underlying area of the scene. You see how it is changing? So the scene gets darker based on a much faster shutter speed and it gets brighter based on a much slower shutter speed. But hang on for a second. That's an interesting thought that's going on here, right? So we are in aperture priority. We have chosen F1.7. We have fixed the ISO, not auto ISO. And the only free parameter which can be tweaked to be updated according to the light metering happening here in the scene is the shutter speed. What happens if I go into fully manual mode and fix that at 1 over 125 seconds? Or let's go here to maybe 1 over 60 seconds. If I now move that cross here, nothing happens any longer, which is totally logical, right? That means the effect you saw when the scene was updating based on the light metering in the scene is no longer working when I'm in fully manual mode because the light triangle has only three values, ISO, aperture and shutter speed. And if all three of them are fixed, the effect we saw before in aperture priority is completely annihilated. It's no longer there. I need to go back into aperture priority to see everything I just showed on how exposure is updating here, depending on where I move my focus and light metering cross. That doesn't work if I'm in fully manual mode and I'm not sure if everyone is always aware of that. Here you have control over your exposure. That's why it is called fully manual mode. Everything needs to be tweaked by yourself. You can control the highlights by going to a much faster shutter speed and then your highlights will no longer be as bright in the scene. You can control the shadows by going to a slower shutter speed and so on. So let's quickly recapitulate. So first of all, we are in fully manual mode. So we have chosen an aperture for controlling depth of field. We've chosen a shutter speed for controlling motion blurriness and the brightness of the scene. And uh, we also have a fixed ISO value of 100, which is the base ISO of the Leica Q3. And then of course, since every of the three values in the light triangle is fixed, we do not see how the scene brightness is updating in dependence on what's underlying that focusing and light metering cross, which is now at Jennifer's body. So if you wanna get back the effect we saw in aperture priority where the camera adjusts the brightness of the scene, depending on what's metered in terms of light, we need to give one of the three parameters in the light triangle free to get updated by the camera. And the obvious one here is ISO. So let's go into auto ISO now, and then you will see what happens. Here we go. And now you will see how this is updating again. I switched off that LED light in the background, by the way, but you see how the brightness of the scene is adjusting in the same way as we saw it in aperture priority before. And still I have in fully manual mode now under control my depth of field via the aperture and motion blurriness and you know brightness of the scene by a fixed shutter speed. So that's the way it works. And uh, I thought at least I mentioned it, there will be also beginners watching this video. And for these people, I think that little excursion into the light triangle and how spot metering affects the brightness of a scene depending on what you tweak manually or where you give it into free float like here the ISO value so that the camera can steer it that might be a useful quick exercise. I will show a few more settings for still images before I conclude part one of my tutorial and the next one I want to cover is exposure compensation and if you choose that you get here at the bottom of the LCD the usual scale and uh, I can make the scene brighter or I can make it darker. Oh, hang on, nothing is happening here. And why is that? Well, it's very simple because we are in fully manual mode and that lines up with what I said before on spot metering and light triangle with ISO, aperture and shutter speed. We have a fixed ISO, we have set the aperture to f1.7 widest open and we have one over 60 seconds as shutter speed. And of course, if I then go into exposure compensation, nothing happens. I can turn this here as much as I want to a higher or lower value, 
nothing will happen because none of the parameters in the light triangle is free to be set by the camera. I did everything manually. There's nothing more to say. So let's go for a moment into aperture priority here. Let's say we keep the f1.7. Let's also go to field metering. I think that is maybe a bit better for what I want to show. Let's go here. So we have field metering and field autofocus. And uh, we have now set the aperture and the ISO, but the shutter speed is free to be set by the camera and it's no longer controlled by me because I'm in aperture priority, as you can see here in that symbol in the lower left-hand side corner. If I now go back into the exposure compensation setting here, I have again my scale and now I can make it brighter or I can make it darker by exposure compensation. And if we go to the anchor point, the value where we started, the only free parameter here is the shutter speed is one over 40 seconds. Let's make this now brighter. Let's go here by two EVs. Let's go back into live view and then you see it corrected the exposure time or shutter speed to one over 10 seconds. And that's the way the image gets brighter because this is the only free parameter. Let's go back into exposure compensation. Let's make it darker. So we go to minus two. This setting on exposure compensation with minus two EVs will now be much, much faster in terms of shutter speed. So let's lock this in. Let's go back and you see it's now instead of one over 40 seconds, one over 160 seconds. And that's the way exposure compensation works. You can only use it if one of the three parameters in the light triangle is free to be set by the camera and not manually adjusted by you and then you can use it in the usual way for exposure compensation. In the same way as what I told you when we spoke about spot metering in fully manual mode and still the brightness of the scene being adjusted by the camera and not by myself, I need to give one of these three parameters free so that the camera can operate it. And in this case, it will be ISO. So first of all, let's set exposure compensation back to zero. So this is done. And now let's switch here into fully manual mode on shutter speed and on aperture, but let's freely float the ISO value. So I go here to let's say one over 60 seconds again and on ISO, let's go to auto ISO. Here we go. And under auto ISO, we see now that the camera decided for an ISO value of 160. And if I now go into exposure compensation and uh, give an uptick of one full stop, then you will see that the ISO value has gone up and look here. It went up from 160 to 320, which is exactly one stop on the ISO parameter. So that's the way exposure compensation works. And uh, on the other direction, that's now interesting to show quickly. If we go here into exposure compensation to minus one EV, by the way, what is important here is always lock it in by a push to the center button. If I now immediately go to the shutter release button, it will still be at plus one, which we had before. Have a look. Look, it's still at 320, not at 160 and definitely not at minus one EV. So you need to lock this in with the center button. See, it's still plus one EV. Otherwise, it will not update the exposure compensation. So lock it in with a push to the center button. Then you see now it's minus EV and now the ISO value will be lower than 160. Namely, I guess something at 80, that would be the calculatory correct value, but the nearest approximation is an ISO of 100. If your photography workflow requires exposure compensation a lot, it will be convenient to have it on a button. And uh, if we go into customize camera or customize controls, you get here, for instance, the wheel assignment, which is this one here. And we can go into that and can say this should be exposure compensation. If I choose that and I'm here in live view again, I can now use the control wheel and you see here on the scale, this is now going up. This is going even brighter to two false stops. I can also make it darker here and so on. And now you have it on a wheel and you don't have to jump into the menu with at least two clicks. And if you are somewhere else in the menu, it will be more clicks and then go down here to exposure compensation. You just conveniently have it now here on the thumb wheel on the rear side of the camera, which is something you wanna consider if exposure compensation is part of your photography routine. If you wanna use that wheel here, control wheel for something else, there are a few more options. Let's go into that setting. You have here wheel assignment and you could also use this for ISO for instance. Then watch the ISO value here, now is 400, 800, now is 100, depending on what I turn here on the control wheel. You can still use that part of the camera for controlling your exposure compensation. And there is a customizable button here in the middle of that control wheel, press and hold, and then go down here to exposure compensation. 
And now if you tap on that button in the middle, it gives you the scale and now you can use the wheel in the same way as you could use it before to control exposure compensation. Simple like that. Let's go back into the menu because there are a couple of more things I want to say before I conclude that video. First of all, here is your ISO. You can go to auto and then the largest value you get here is 100,000. That is new on the Leica Q3. Works very simple, but you can also have this here, of course, on the button if you didn't use it in the way I just showed. For exposure compensation, you just press and hold and then you see here ISO. And now if you tap on it, you get the ISO and you can use the wheel here or also touch functionality if you want to basically get this to a different ISO value. Very simple. So that's all about ISO in terms of manual settings. And then there is also on the next page here, auto ISO settings. And that's also something I want to cover. And then I conclude part one of the video because white balance will be a longer topic for part number two. Auto ISO is simple. You can set a maximum ISO value here and you can tweak this up to 100,000. I think it's safe with that camera to shoot up to 25,000. I had a video on high dynamic range and uh, high ISO values for the Leica Q3. I will post the link down below in the info box. If you have not seen it, please look it up and get your own data points here. Then you have shutter speed limit and there is also a representation here graphically at the bottom. If I push the center button, I can now tweak this from auto to 102,000, which is the fastest shutter speed with mechanical shutter. And then we can set here a limit for the shutter speed, which uh, is sometimes useful to have a threshold. And then you have the same maximum ISO and shutter speed limit value for flash and uh, for using flash photography in the studio or outside, depending on where you are. And that basically concludes everything for part number one. I hope you enjoyed that presentation. It's a lot of work to make this type of videos. And if you appreciate the content on my channel, please drop me a thumbs up. Stay tuned on my content. There is always more to come. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and healthy. And of course, peace out.